the breath, the breath of life, the breath of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for this time that we can gather so freely and worship you. Lord, we gather in this building, in this place, but Lord, let there be a gathering all around the world in the body of Christ, singing your praises, singing praises to your holy name. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. In the book of Romans, we've just been singing about the breath in our lungs, but it's also the power of the Holy Spirit. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living in you. And this is not just about being raised from the dead. Maybe it is in a spiritual sense. We're being raised from spiritual deadness with the power of Christ. the power in your name. We thank you for the love in your name. We thank you that we can come boldly into the throne room and see you and meet you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Now in the power of the Holy Spirit, and that power is love, turn and greet someone you didn't come to church with. We're going to do the offering. As we're doing that, we've got a whole bunch of announcements today. And so I'm going to start. We're going to have three people talking to you other than myself. Uh, and so we're going to get through this uh, quickly. So we can take up our tithes and our offerings. Again, just encourage you to give generously and, and of the heart. I think the Lord requires that of us to do things from our heart. And so as you give, give freely from the heart. So welcome, it's great to have you at church this morning. There is morning tea downstairs after the service. Now next Sunday we have our cafe, church, potluck, lunch on again. It's already a month has gone past. Isn't that gone quickly? And so next Sunday it's bring along something to share. And so don't feel intimidated by that. Uh, Woolworths do uh, roast chickens for about 10 or $11. And that serves two or three people. And uh, I'm more than happy with just me. So come along next Sunday after the service. We're going to go downstairs and have lunch. It was a great time um, four weeks ago. It's going to be a great time on Sunday. Just a reminder, don't put any nuts in anything that you make or bring, okay? You don't want to kill me. Uh, we have, uh, we're, we're still looking for volunteers. I had a couple of emails come through this week. And thank you for you guys who are putting your hands up to get involved and do stuff. But we're looking for people to help out with the flowers on the church, with the, the beautiful flowers that you see up there. Uh, we're looking for a, another barista. Pip has said that she will do more. How awesome is Pip? Yep. But always looking for more people who want to learn how to do this kind of stuff. And there's lots of areas in our church that we need more people to help out with, i.e., the data projection over there with Andrew. We're looking for more people who know how to use the program of PowerPoint and uh, to do and help with all this kind of stuff that's in, in front of you this morning. Let's pray and give thanks to God. How are you going, Sharon? It's good to see you here this morning. Mother and son, isn't that beautiful? We've got auntie and niece, and then we've got Gary. It's the first time you've done this. It's awesome. Let's just pray. So Father, we thank you for Sharon and for Jeremy and the beauty of generations that are right here. And we want to pray for this generation that's represented and serving us this morning. Lord, that you will allow, which I know you will, that you will today that the encounter of love for both Sharon and Jeremy will go to new levels, new discoveries, new joys, and that you'll continue to bind them together with cords of love. Patricia and for Ellie, we thank you again for generations, kind of a step sideways, but still so beautiful. And we say thank you, Lord, for the way that Trish sows into the next generation. We thank you for Ellie. And we thank you, Lord, for the desire of her heart just to be free. It's so beautiful to watch as someone so young uh, celebrate life and dance. And Ellie turns five, so Lord, we just want to say happy birthday to Ellie. And for Gary, Lord, I thank you for this man's heart. 
heart of restoration, growth and strength. And Lord, today we pray that you'll place your hand upon him and renew his strength. And so, Lord, today we thank you for an opportunity to give through tithes and offerings. We ask, Lord, that you'll continue to do incredible things with the things, Lord, that we give to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so here we go. So Miriam is going to come up first. Here she is. Let's give her a round of applause. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I want to ask you a few to think about a few issues. And I don't necessarily want you to answer out loud, but have a think in your own mind. And so, so I want to ask you, have you ever been disappointed with Jesus? How about hearing from God? Do you actually regularly hear from God? And if not, would you like that to improve? Thanks. That's good to have an answer for that. <laughs> Uh, then what about fear? Has fear been an issue in your life? And if so, how have you dealt with it or have you given in to it? What about uh, prayer? How's your prayer life going? Could that also be perhaps made more exciting? How about sex? Sex been an issue in your life uh, or challenges in your life? And, okay, we won't, don't need to speak about that one. What about, <laughs> and what about parenting? I know we've got some young families here, but we've all got young people in our lives. How are parenting issues with you? Has that been a challenge? Well, look, I want to tell you that all these issues are directly covered in resources, books, DVDs that we've got downstairs in our library. And it's a wealth down there. And like I said, these issues that I raised, they've been taken directly from, from items down there. So if you said yes to any of those, head on downstairs afterwards and have a look. Now, um, like me, I get Kurong ads in my email box. Well. You know what, if you like heading off to Kurong once in a while, how about coming downstairs first? Because you might be surprised that we actually have a mini Kurong down there. And you know what? There's no 20% off, there's 100% off. So it's well worth it. Now we've got, there's autobiographies, people like um, Nikki Cruz, um, uh, various other ones. There's short autobiographies, groups of stories about people, Australian people. There's fiction, there's Christian fiction, there's music, heaps of good music. There's conferences. If you've wanted to go to, for example, a Hillsong conference and have been, haven't been able to get there, well, there's DVDs down there from the Hillsong conferences and other conferences. A, virtual tour of Israel, if you've got a VHS player still. Uh, but honestly, there's, there's tracts, there's, there's tracts and devotionals that you can keep, and if you want to give them out, always handy to have in your bag. Uh, there's cards, greeting cards, uh, postcards, and there's items for kids. And I'm just, I'll get my props. Okay. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Tish. Audio tapes of Hearing God from Dallas Willard. Fabulous program. You can listen to it in the car. How can I hear God speak to me? Conference CDs, DVDs from Hillsong. Inspirational Australian stories from by people. The interviews. How people grow. Mere Christianity, a good classic. Um, Amazing Grace, John Newton. Fabulous, so entertaining. And Run Baby Run from Nikki Cruz, also really just impacting. Anyway, um, cards, audio Bible, 
listen to it in the car, listen to it while you're doing housework. Just a great opportunity. Building confidence in your child and other parenting books. There's Bibles. So do yourself a favour. While you're waiting for coffee, have a browse around the, the uh, book, book, uh, bookshelf. Uh, it's a, basically a borrow system, but if some, there's something that you really want, just hang on to it. There's no, there's no forms to fill in or, or pieces of paper. Just, just take it, bring it back when you've done with it, and we just love to see it used. I would love to see some empty shelves. There you go. Okay. Okay, just real quick, women's retreat. Women's retreat's different this year. Women's retreat is called, not breathe, but the way, the truth, and the life. Come and soak in Jesus. It's going to be different. Come and be in his presence. Come and enjoy his love. Let it flow over you. Just come. October 26th to 28th. There's a sign-up sheet at the back. Come see me for more info. Head on up. Come on down. Hello everyone. So in the school holidays on the True Thursday, so it's the 4th and the 11th, we are running a kids holiday program. And what I'm asking from all of you is if you have a working with children check or a safe ministry tra training program, which you can get both of them, I'm asking for volunteers to help make it possible to lead at this kids program. So we just need people to supervise, help out with just making sure kids are safe, maybe just setting up a morning tea or anything like that. So if you're interested, either speak to Matt, myself, or Ida. And so just remind 4th and the 11th of October. We hope to see you there. If you can't volunteer, prayer would also be awesome as well. Thank you. It's been many, many years since we've done a children's program in a holiday time. I remember when I was way younger and we did this, something like this and so encouraged. I wanted to be doing it. So the kids are going downstairs, Rochelle's going to come up and give us the Bible reading, it's up there on the screen, it's taken from Romans chapter 8 verses 1 to 4, the version that you're going to be hearing is called the Passion Translation. Good morning. Our reading today, as Matt said, is Romans 8, 1 to 4, one of the best chapters ever. So now the case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the Anointed One. For the law of the Spirit of life flowing through the anointing of Jesus has liberated us from the law of sin and death. For God achieved what the law was unable to accomplish because the law was limited by the weakness of human nature. Yet God sent us his Son in human form to identify with human weakness. Clothed with humanity, God's Son gave his body to be the sin offering so that God once and for all condemn sorry, so God for once and for all could condemn the guilt and power of sin. So now every righteous requirement of the law can be fulfilled through the anointed one living his life in us. And we are free to live, not according to the flesh, but according to the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. You, you can leave that one up there, Andrew. Oh, Anna Rochelle. <laughs> In turn four, we've got a, a bunch of new prophetic groups starting up. And uh, again, if this is something you've done, I'd encourage you to do it, redo it. It's a little bit different and new. Um, if you haven't done it yet, uh, again, I encourage you to start thinking about it. Those groups are still filling up uh, fairly quickly. Um, so Ida's created a like a waiting list right now, and so if you're a part of that, she's put you into that, and uh, pretty soon she'll be starting to allocate those things out. Uh, the groups that I'm running in turn four are all full, uh, and so again, people from all over the place uh, are connecting in. Um, I had a strange encounter while I was, I've been away this week at a conference in Melbourne and I met some people who knew some people who knew some people who had been here and done prophetic ministry and they tracked me down in Melbourne to, um, to ask me questions about it and, um, and so their daughter is actually wanting to engage with us 
as well. So there's this strange six degrees of separation that's happening, but God's voice has been heard throughout uh, many places, and I'm just so blessed for what God is doing in and through this place here. I want to pray before we come to the Word of God, so I just encourage you to pray with me. And as we do, I'm encouraging you to use your imagination. As we do every single time we pray, we don't actually use that language often, we just pray and we say we pray and that's good. But every time you pray, you actually engage with it. Unless you pray the same prayer every single day in the, of your life, that, that, that means you pray by rote. But if you pray uh, in any way, shape or form where you look for God to drop things into your spirit to say, what should I pray for next? Well, you're actually using your imagination. And it's not too far from that to actually ask the Lord to give you pictures inside of that place, to ask God to, to show it to you. So if you're praying uh, for a sister, if you're praying for a, a son or a daughter, if you're praying for a neighbor, use your imagination to picture that and just say, God, can you enter into their world? Can you touch them? Can, you, can they receive something of you today? And so I just want to encourage you that as we pray, you don't just let my words run out and you say, Amen you actually allow your spirit to engage with the prayer itself. Uh, so let's just pray. Uh, so Father, a couple of weeks ago, I encouraged us to think of a person that we could invite to church. And just for a name to be given. And so Father, in this moment, would you just drop that name again into our hearts? And allow that name to take seed and to, to grow. And, and then for that person to appear in, in our imagination as we pray for them and invite Christ to minister to them. Allow him to show you things that maybe you haven't seen before of how Christ wants to love on that person. And care for that person. Heal that person, restore that person. And so, Father, we want to say thank you for those people that everyone in this room are now raising up. Uh, you love them as much as you love us. You've forgiven them as much as you've forgiven us. And it's relationship that you desire. And so, Lord, as I speak this morning, it's relationship that you're offering to us in grace. And we so freely give it. And if we so freely get it, now we want to receive another revelation. So, Lord, would you speak to us through your word? Would you allow your word to become alive in us so that this week that we can go out and use that word wherever we are uh, to change the, the world that we live in, to speak life to the world that we live in. And so, Lord, we want to cry out to you for a nation right now that just desperately needs rain. I looked at the forecast, Lord, and I saw that rain is supposed to come on Friday, Saturday and Sunday next uh, this coming week. Uh, Father, would you do something in the heavens that draws that earlier in the week? And would you do something in the heavens that allows that rain to fill dams across the state? Uh, Father, right now I just believe that there's so many churches that are just praying for the breaking of a drought. Our hearts, Lord, are turned to you. We desire for you to hear and to do something where you bring the rains back to our lands. And so, Lord, I pray that this week as the rains come, that hearts will rejoice that the Creator has been serving in this way again. But, Lord, we just want to pray for rain. And so, Lord, now as we just come to this time, would you open our ears so that we can hear in Jesus' name. Amen. Like I said this week, I, Trish and I have been down in Melbourne at a, at a conference. And this is a conference I went to last year. And uh, it truly blessed me. And... Uh, Coming back from this conference yesterday, uh, I've got to say that uh, I don't know if I've ever been to a greater conference. It was, it was life-changing for me. It was impacting for me. It, it, uh, so many relationships formed and grown. Uh, I know my kids laugh at me for this, but uh, one of the things that happened to me this week is I got to meet uh, Bill Johnson. Now, if you don't know who Bill Johnson is, we sing a whole bunch of his songs from his church. So, No Longer Slaves, that's one of... Uh, his church's songs. Reckless Love, that's one of his church's songs. We sing a whole bunch from his, his church. And, and um, his church's music is, is once again changing the world uh, of the churches, where churches are singing these songs of grace. And, um, and so Bill, he's a grandfather, and he's a real father of the faith. And, and uh, last year I got to meet him and shake his hand and don't wash my hand for about three days after that. 
Um, but this time, uh, I, who's laughing at me? Yeah, is that uh, some of the back there? Um, just the fanboy moment. But um, Trish and I turned up at the conference on Friday morning. We walked into the foyer of the church, and as soon as we stopped, Bill Johnson walked up to Trish and I. He said, how's it going? <laughs> now, have you ever been confronted with somebody that you respect more than pretty much most people on the planet? Like, uh, you're trying to find a word that doesn't sound like you're an absolute idiot uh, was, was kind of hard, and I choked some words out. And he just stood there and chatted with us for about five minutes. Uh, where he comes from in Reading, uh, they've had some awful um, bushfires and 1,100 homes in Reading were lost and it looked like the church might have even gone up at one point, but it didn't. And here he is, pulls his phone out and he's showing me shots and photos of, of where he lives. And I'm standing there with Trish just going, is this for real? Is, is this for real? Like nobody is standing around us and Trish and I are just chatting with Bill Johnson. Um, on that lunchtime on Friday, I got invited to have lunch with Bill Johnson. I sat beside him. He touched my leg. And they, they, these, <laughs> these were the jeans that I was wearing. I haven't washed them. His DNA is, is right here. All that's to say is that when I met him, I met a man that just wanted to be loved as a man and wanted to be respected as a man. There was no platform that separated he and I. There was no, um, there was no issue for him to come and talk with me. He just did. And what I, I saw and what I witnessed and what I received is the way the church should be. Like I've been to many conferences and, and there's times where you go, gee, I really would love to have a chat with that person, but you know that you never will because it's just... Yeah, they, they, like they've got security guards and all kinds of stuff. But this guy just walked up to me in a foyer and had a conversation. A friend of mine uh, this week said to me, oh, I want to go to Bethel and I want to meet Bill Johnson. Can you introduce me to him or can you tell me? And I said, come to Melbourne, get on a plane and you can meet him. And he said, would you introduce me to him? And I said, you can introduce yourself. He is available. He, if you don't understand who he is, like he is a world leader of the church at this point in time. The things that he says, lots of people love and, and appreciate and some people don't. But he carries such a grace that walks up to you in the foyer of a church and says, how's it going? I felt loved on at that point in time. I, I felt seen at that point in time. He doesn't know me. He doesn't know what I do. He doesn't know anything about that. Uh, he just wanted to have a conversation and decided that Trish and I seemed to be the people that he was going to have a chat with. And... I saw a moment where relationship in the way the church should run, does run. Often when you speak with people like that, you don't know what to say. And I know even when, so how it happened to be sitting next to him at lunch, uh, there was two seats and Trish went and sat in the one and there was only one left, so I just got to sit next to, to Bill. It kind of felt a little bit awkward because every other person in that room, there's probably 20 people, wanted to sit where I sat. Tough luck. I sat there. But in doing so, I got to meet a guy who just carries grace and leaks it. It was such a blessing. After that, I, I met an, another man who was serving us and, um, and the, the church that we were at, they just served so, so well. And, and this guy, he was making me a coffee and um, he said, oh, where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm from Sydney and, and whatnot. And, it, and I said, oh, what do you do here? And he says this phrase to me, I'm nothing special. I just serve here. Okay. The next thing, he's making my coffee and he stops and he looks at me. And he says, and he goes into this place of prophecy and he says, you're the guy that sees things in the spirit and explains them in the natural. And Trish is beside me and my, another pastor mate's beside me. My pastor mate goes, come on, and walks away. I could not believe it, right? And then, because this guy again doesn't know me, but he speaks this word over me. And um, he goes, you are an officer or a general in the kingdom of God, but the father sees you as his son. means so much to me. And I said to him, if that's what nothing special is in this church, 
I wonder what being special looks like. This guy was special. Why I share those stories with you is we're about to speak a passage where it says there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation uh, separates you in relationship. Uh, Condemnation always speaks to your identity and never speaks well to your identity. And so the self-condemnation I was feeling in myself when I came to lunch and I saw that seat beside Bill is who am I to sit there? That's, ex- that's honestly how I felt. I didn't feel like I had the right to sit there. Like there are better people than me in the room that can sit there. And there's probably people with smarter questions that need to ask of that, that could sit there. And, and there's this self-condemnation. What's it doing? It's attacking my identity and removing that place from where I could actually sit. Fortunately, Trish believed in me a bit, bit better than my self-condemnation did. And she said, sit here. I said, okay, I'll obey. And in sitting there, I received. Condemnation has this way of destroying relationships. Condemnation has this mechanism uh, where it lifts you above people to look down on people. In Australian culture, we have tall poppy syndrome, which says we pull you down to our level. That's not how it works. We don't just pull you down to our level. We pull you down to below us so we can look down on you and judge you for what we think about you. Condemnation destroys relationships. Where love has this way of setting relationships free. I say this to the Bible study group that if condemnation is your mechanism, then you are the one with the problem. So if you can't help but judge people, if you can't help but see the poor in in other people, the poor behaviours, the poor attitudes in other people, then I want to say to you that the mechanism that you're using is not one of love, it's actually one of, of condemnation. And and Paul is speaking to a a people group and often with the Jews, they would lift themselves to that place to say, you're not doing it right. You're not believing for it right. Your behaviour needs to match this. Your attitudes need to match this. And, And what condemnation does is destroy any possible relationship where love can impact that person to change and transform that person. Are you with me on that? Do you understand what I'm saying? All of us have probably had relationships in our lives where we have brought condemnation into it or we have received condemnation. Is that true? Okay. And it's easy for us to fall into those patterns of the past, into those patterns of condemnation. And so envy is is a pattern of condemnation. And so this week some dude puts a lottery ticket in at the last minute and wins $50 million. And we go, we wish we could have that. Why does he deserve that? I deserve that. And all of a sudden, we're condemning a guy for the fortune that he's come into. Why? Because we don't have what he's got. And so we want to bring him down. But again, we don't want to bring him down. We want to bring him under. I deserve that. I should have had that. I need that. I could have done this with that. And all of a sudden, condemnation is your mechanism. Then you become the problem. The Apostle Paul here says, though, there is there now for no condemnation. I want to point out one little thing in this, in this passage before we go any further. You know my big thing about we're not sinners? If you have a traditional Bible version of this, or even a new living that I'm, I'm looking at right here, in verse, in verse uh, 3, it says this, So God did, not, did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. You might have your Bible open and you can read there. The Apostle Paul seems to say that we sinners, and he includes himself as a sinner. When I read that, when I was preparing this message, I went back to the Greek and discovered that that's not even the word that's used. It's not there. And in here, it's why I'm using the Passion Translation this morning, because this translation here is more in alignment with what the Greek is about The Apostle Paul does not include himself as a sinner in this. The Apostle Paul said, in once I was in sin, but Christ has set me free. And for those who have been set free, don't go back to places of bondage. 
And so here when you read it in Scripture and it feels like the Bible is saying you are a sinner, then I want you to stop that and I actually want you to understand that that is not what God is speaking over you today. He is not declaring that you are a sinner because there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Now, when the Apostle Paul writes passages like this, in most translations, verse 8 starts with, There is therefore now no condemnation. When Paul uses the word therefore, what he's actually saying, because of everything I've just written, I want to give to you an understanding of what this now looks like. So what I'd like to do is just to read to you a little bit about Paul, the way Paul was thinking and see if you can follow me in this. So this is chapter 7, verse 14. It says, So the trouble is not with the law, for it's spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself. Anyone want to say amen to that? I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know what I'm do doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It's the sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I, but if I, do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing it. It's the sin living in me. Are you following me? Not really, right? Paul's in a bit of a spin. And he's talking about this whole concept of sin. Has anyone been in a spin when they've been talking about the concepts of sin and freedom? And here is the Apostle Paul and he's saying it. And he says, I've discovered this principle of life. That when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all of my heart, but there is another law within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Question mark. Now, the Apostle Paul is not waiting for an answer. He actually gives it. It's like a rhetorical question in Scripture. He says, thank God the answer is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Way back in the Old Testament, there's a story of condemnation. And I want to show you how condemnation changes lives. Back in 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, Elijah, uh, he, he is a prophet of Israel, uh, a very famous prophet. Uh, at the time, the king is Ahab, and he's married to this awesome woman, that sarcasm right there, I'll just insert in the sarcasm sign, called Jezebel, right? Uh, she's a piece of work, if I can use that in all due respects. And they're, they're not too happy with Elijah. Uh, Elijah seems, when you read scripture, just goes missing in action at times. People want to find him, but they can't. Usually when they want to find him, they want to kill him. Uh, so God just keeps moving him around Israel and the area. Anyway, there's a drought going on in Israel, strangely enough. There's a drought going on in Australia. And God comes to Elijah and says, you need to go to King Ahab and you've got to tell him that the, the drought's about to break. Now, here's the grace of God, right? Ahab has not repented. Uh, he is a bad king. Uh, he has got a really troublesome relationship with his wife. Um, and God says, I'm actually going to do a thing here where I'm going to break the drought. And it's not dependent upon Ahab's uh, repentance. And he says, I need you to go find him. So anyway, long story short, you can read the whole in 1, 1 Kings 18. But Elijah stands, comes and stands in front of Ahab. And Ahab says this. You are the troublemaker of Israel. I love that. You ever been called a troublemaker? Probably been called worse things, but but um, you are the troublemaker of Israel. And what's what's Ahab doing? He's condemning him. He's putting him down. He's pushing him down. He's trying to lift himself above. He doesn't actually want to hear what Elijah's got to say, but he knows Elijah hears the voice of God. So he's going, I probably need to hear it, but I don't really want to hear it. You caused me a lot of trouble. And that trouble, uh, you know, it's a lot of trouble with my wife. And my wife said, yeah, well, you, you, Elijah, what have you got to say? I'm here to tell you the drought's about to finish. Anyway, the story then progresses. 
Because in Israel at the time, it's not just God that they're worshipping. They're worshipping um, what they call the Ashra, and they're also worshipping Baal. And, and they have this cosmic moment where, where Elijah says, I've had enough, and God's had enough. And what we're going to do is we're going to have this, this moment where the gods are going to have war on top of a mountain, and we're going to see who, which one's the strongest. And he says to the, the prophets of Baal and Ashra, you've got to create an altar, and, and, we, and you guys are going to pray, and we're going to see what your gods do to that altar. Now, you probably know the story. Uh, and so they get together that morning and, and the prophets of Baal and Asherah, they, they're crying out, they're screaming to their God, they're cutting themselves, they're bleeding for their God and, and nothing's happening. And by lunchtime, Elijah's getting hungry and he, so he starts mocking them and just says to them, what's going on? Is your God on the, in the bathroom? Where has he gone? Is he missing in action? And eventually Elijah says, hey, it's my turn. And so Elijah himself uh, takes, builds the Ola, and the Bible says he gets 12 stones to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And that really means something to me, because again, the whole concept of the number 12 in Scripture is this whole concept of the family of God. And here is Elijah putting this thing back together. It's so prophetic. He's putting it back together. One stone, two stones, up to 12 stones, he puts this together. And, and then he gets a, a, like a fatted um, bull. It's a young bull and he, and he cuts it up and he puts it on top of the altar. Uh, and, and then he says, we're going to make sure that this is going to be a beyond all reasonable understanding. We're going to pour some water over it. And Elijah had dug a trench around the altar and they poured so much water over it that it filled the, filled the trench. And then God, and then he comes to God and he says to God, now it's your turn. Can you show these people who the true God is? And in a moment, there's a bolt of lightning or a fire from heaven that comes down and doesn't just do a barbecue on the meat. It actually destroys everything that is there and it consumes everything that is there. So the rocks go, the, the wood goes, the water goes, the bull goes, and everyone's there with their mouths on the ground, right? That's a massive moment in the kingdom of God. And there's no condemnation here other than for the people of Baal and the people of the Asherah, and they lose their lives. And now you would think that, that, that Elijah is on top of a mountain here literally and, and spiritually, and God's doing great things, and then he watches as the drought breaks. Now Ahab has watched this whole thing too, and he sees the power of God. And what Ahab has to do is go back to his wife, who's back there in Israel, and says, um, Honey, you know all your... Your prophets, they're dead. Yeah, and all the prophets of Baal, they're, they're dead too. Now, Jezebel didn't take that well. You ever told anybody some news and they've just not taken that very well at all? Well, there's that and then there's Jezebel. Uh, she lost it and she, and she makes an oath and she tells Elijah, I'm going to kill you. And if I don't, my life is forfeit. When you make promises like that, you've got to be careful what you say, right? Um, but what happened is she condemned Elijah. Elijah ran. He disappeared. Why? Because condemn, condemnation speaks to your identity. It speaks to who you are. It destroys relationships. And in this point, uh, Elijah, who's just watched God do something incredible in the skies with both fire and rain, and now he is running for fear of his life. Every single one of us have to learn to deal with condemnation in our lives one way or another. If you run, you're always running away from the problem. If you're willing to sit within... I'm not telling you it's going to be comfortable, but I'm going to tell you you're going to overcome whatever that is because you're going to discover the identity that God has called you into. When Jesus was dealt, uh, dealt with many people who were in and under condemnation, think about that. Think of all the stories you know in the New Testament of Jesus who dealt with people. And most times he dealt with people who had been condemned. So a blind guy. Uh, the disciples say, was it his sin or was it his parents' sin? Why are they condemning him? Because he thinks that they've done something wrong. 
And Jesus goes, it's none of them. It's not that sin. Or what about when he has dinner with tax collectors? And the Pharisees come along and say, what are you eating with such scum for? What are they doing? Yeah, they're taking them and putting them down below them. Uh, what about when, when, when a woman's thrown at Jesus' feet, caught in the act of adultery? There is condemnation all around from every other person except for the one who loves her as he, as he, lo as he loves God. And there he's lifting her out of condemnation. The tax collectors, he's lifting them out of condemnation. The blind guy that's at the temple, lifting him out of condemnation. Uh, there's lepers that come to Jesus that everyone else keeps away from. What does Jesus do? He lifts them out of condemnation. There's legion who's trapped with all the de demonic spirits. He lifts him out of con condemnation. Do you see what Jesus does? He takes the power of condemnation and draws people out, draws it out of it and speaks to their identity and speaks to who they are. Every single person it seems that Jesus has this encounter with, he draws them into a place where they are free where they have been set free, where they have been restored and are being restored. This is what the love of the Father and the power of the love actually does in our society today. Sometimes we're too scared to love because we fear what, we, what is going to happen. We fear being condemned. But I want to say to you, this season that we're in, this is now a season where we are called to love others as Christ has loved us. As Christ has loved us. Let me finish with this. Last night we did our, our extra service, which was probably one of the biggest ones we've had. Um, and again, a whole range of people from all over Sydney. Uh, and, and one of the things that I, I witnessed and watched last night, um, one was actually extraordinary. And I'm still trying to work out in my brain how it actually happened. At one point we were prophesying over a couple who just got married. And, and Trish is filming and videoing it and as she's filming everyone starts pointing to the lights and from where I was standing the light was straight in my face so I couldn't see what they're pointing but she actually has it on video of particles flowing through and they look gold just flowing through the lights and onto this couple I've never seen this before in my life uh, it's on video so if you see Trish after the service say can I just have a look at that and so through both sets of lights, we're seeing, and it wasn't windy in here, we had no fans on, there was nothing like that happening. I still, in my brain, I'm going, what on earth was that? But last night, the presence of God landed in this place in a really powerful way. Did it not, Craigie? Like, it was a fantastic night. Um, one of the things the Lord showed me this week while I was away, and I was praying at one point, and he gave to me a vision of a map. Uh, so, like a treasure map. And in that treasure map, there was one piece of that treasure map in it. And I felt like the Lord said to me, Matt, that is you. But you are only one piece. That's not to put me down at all. That's just for me to understand what the vision was about. And so what that said to me is, one, there is a treasure map, which two, that means there is a treasure. But as I watched what happened last night is more people, as they spoke out, more pieces of the puzzle started being added. And before you know it, you saw this beautiful puzzle in my imagination of another piece, another piece, another piece. Lisa shared a word. Lily shared a word. Richard shared a word. Uh, Trish shared a word. Uh, like Craig called us into worship. And, and pa parts of the puzzle started being fitted together. And, and what I witnessed was a church operating without condemnation. Last night we worshipped for two and a half hours, right? Now when I say that to most people, they go, that's too long. My fingers said, yes, that's too long. But my heart just goes, I don't want to be anywhere else. A, a lady came last night, and I just want to read to you. She said, I've never met this lady before. I, I, she emailed me uh, a few weeks ago and wants to get involved with some of the prophetic stuff. And she, she came along and she said, tonight was fantastic. I really loved it, an excellent space. And I really I was really moved by the raw worship and devotion. Thanks for inviting me along. And thanks for the heart that you carry. So many little bits of testimony flowed. Why? Because God was doing what he does. The Bible here speaks about the Holy Spirit that sets us free. And the Bible here says it's the law of the Holy Spirit. Now, you may not have ever heard of the law of the Holy Spirit. But when something is a law, it is no longer a theory. So I can tell you that you are set free in Christ. And you go, well, is that a theory? Because I've not really felt that. 
Uh, is that really tr Well, the Bible says it is, is a law, which means it can be tested. It means it can be proved. It means it can be shown. And so here the Apostle Paul is saying, because of Christ and this great gift, there is no condemnation over your life because he paid that price and just got rid of all of that stuff, all that guilt, all that shame, all that disobedience, all that living life the way that you did. He, Jesus did this. And so now the Holy Spirit is, is allowing you into this place of freedom. And it's a law. It is proven. It is true. It can be relied upon. It can be believed in. Uh, it, it is faith giving and it's both faith receiving. There's something about what God does when the Holy Spirit is here. Before you know it, he's doing things that you can't even possibly imagine. This is what it means to follow the Holy Spirit. When I titled this message a month ago about following the Holy Spirit, I had no real idea what I was going to say about it. But when you follow the Holy Spirit, it's like when Jesus says, follow me, it means become like me, as if you are me. So if you're following after God or Christ's Holy Spirit, you are becoming more and more of what the Spirit is pouring into you. Uh, John's, uh, John the Baptist said, I must decrease and he must increase. That, that's what it means. Uh, the more that I fall in love with him, the more that his love flows from me. Uh, that, that, that's what it means. Uh, the more that I receive from him, the, the less that I know that I need to work in my own strength. Uh, this is what it is to, to follow the Holy Spirit. You might be known as a troublemaker of Israel. So be it. But if you're going to carry the words of the kingdom, just know that some people may get upset with that and that's okay. But as we saw last night, most people actually fell in love with that. Uh, most people rejoiced over that. Uh, most people could not get enough of that. So let's just pray. And I want to speak to the followers of the Holy Spirit. Followers of Christ, followers of the Spirit of God. Your lives are changing and transforming. You've been asked to believe for greater encounters of love and to be a greater encounter of love. To know you leak what you carry. And so for me to, to meet a man of such stature in the name of Bill Johnson, but at the same time just to meet a, a guy by the name of Bill, who just wants to share part of the road with me for a time. And that we can open our hearts and share in that place. Lord, we want to say thank you for little moments in time like that. But Father, I thank you for meeting a guy and just serving and making coffee in the same. And his words probably impacted me even more than what Bill had to say to me. And he says, I'm nothing special. Well, if that's nothing special, then I'm very happy to be in that place too. And so, Lord, this morning, as we, we come into this time to finish a service, where very quickly we think, can forget what we hear and very quickly we can move into the next thing we have to do, may we just stop for a moment and remind ourselves, I am free. Christ has done everything to set me free. And at times my sin confuses me, at times it challenges me, at times it messes with my brain like it did with the Apostle Paul. But thank God that the answer is Jesus. And thank God that that answer declares over me that there is no condemnation towards me or for me. And I just want to declare out then, therefore, there will be no condemnation from me. And so, Lord, I just want to pray for the, those of us here who are feeling at times that we've been under condemnation. And there may be some of your relationships right now where you feel like in your life that you've been under somebody else's condemnation. I want to pray that you're going to find new avenues to love those people that you've never seen before. And that might be scary, that might be challenging, uh, but I want to say to you that it's no surprise to God and he has love. And so he will not let you fall or stumble. He will not put you in those, uh, those places where abuse will happen. He just wants you to love like he would love. And I want to pray that right now that the love of Jesus will flow in and through you and give you wisdom as you learn to love others uh, as Christ has loved you. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, Father, we want to come before you right now. Thank you for the relationship that you have given to us. 
Thank you, Father, for the conversation that you have included us in and that you want to hear us. Father, I want to pray for the relationships in this very room that each have with you. That this day, Lord, that we will just again just have a greater awakening or just a greater moment of understanding just how powerful your love and your grace is. So great for us that it restored our lives to eternity. So great for us that it removed condemnation and shame and guilt from our lives. So great for us that it drives fear away. So great for us that healing is here. And so, Lord, I pray that this week, that as we are followers of your Spirit, that we will see you, that we will hear you, that we will grow with you. Father, may your joy and your peace be upon each person's life here today. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to come on downstairs and have a cup of coffee with us.